Welcome to section two of gastrointestinal embryology. In this section, we'll be discussing embryo-related pathology associated with the foregut and the hindgut. Let's get started. This image shows the entire GI tract, and many pathologies can occur during embryogenesis any part along the GI tract. But as mentioned on the previous slide, this lecture will be focused on those pathologies related to the foregut, which you can see labeled here, and the hindgut, which you can see labeled here. Pathology associated with the midgut and intestinal atresia will be discussed in the following section. The first foregut pathology that we'll discuss is hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. This condition occurs because there's hypertrophy of the inner circular layer of the GI tract at the point of the pylorus, and this leads to obstruction of the gastric outlet. In other words, there's so much hypertrophy that substances in the stomach can't pass through the pylorus, and this usually occurs in males that are between two to six weeks old. And there are a few things to keep in mind regarding presentation. For example, the newborn may show visible peristaltic waves, and you can see this if you're looking at the newborn's belly. Just looking at the skin, you can see those peristaltic waves. It's really interesting. You can also feel an olive-shaped mass. And these patients often have non-bilious projectile vomiting. It's non-bilious because the obstruction is proximal or above the bile duct, so no bile would be in the vomit. And if there's excessive vomiting, Infants can get hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. But keep in mind that this really only occurs if the vomiting occurs for longer than three weeks. And that's pretty uncommon these days. Usually the newborn is brought in by their parents before then. This image illustrates the layers of the gut wall. And it's discussed in great detail in section four of GI anatomy. Right now, I just want to draw your attention to this inner muscular layer. This is the layer that gets hypertrophied, which causes pyloric stenosis. This image shows the stomach and the pylorus leading to the duodenum. And within this pylorus, there's hypertrophy of that inner circular layer of the muscularis propria. And this leads to obstruction at the level of the pylorus. And because of this obstruction, there is such great pressure in the stomach that there is projectile vomiting. And the bile duct enters the duodenum distal to the pylorus. That means that the bile will not mix with the vomit. Therefore, these infants have non-bilious vomiting. And remember that these gastric juices contain lots of hydrochloric acid. So these patients are losing this hydrochloric acid. And with prolonged vomiting, nearly three weeks, the infant can expel so much hydrochloric acid that the body keeps trying to resupply the stomach with hydrogen ions and chloride ions. And this results in hypochloremia and metabolic alkalosis. I also mentioned that they get hypokalemia. And the reason they get hypokalemia is best understood this way. This image demonstrates the cells of the collecting duct of the nephron. The nephron is discussed in great detail in section three of renal physiology. For now, just know there are mainly two cell types in the collecting duct, the principal cells and the alpha intercalated cells. Prolonged vomiting will result in fluid loss, and this will stimulate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. This system is discussed in great detail within section four of renal physiology. Right now, just know that aldosterone production will be increased as a result of this system, and that's the second A. And this aldosterone will then act on the collecting duct of the kidney and increase uptake of sodium, and water will follow sodium. And it does this in exchange for potassium. So potassium will be excreted. So the patients will have hypokalemia. Now that we've discussed the pathophysiology and the presentation of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, Let's talk about the risk factors. These include maternal smoking, genetic factors such as Down syndrome, and even macrolide antibiotics, including azithromycin and erythromycin. And it's unclear why these drugs cause this condition. Okay, now we just discussed hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Next, let's focus on other structures around the foregut, starting with the pancreas. So we'll first discuss pancreas development and then the pathologies associated with the pancreas. The pancreas develops from two different buds derived from the foregut. The dorsal pancreatic bud will form the head, body, and tail of the pancreas, and this does not rotate. However, the ventral pancreatic bud does rotate, and we'll show this in a moment. Also, the ventral pancreatic bud sprouts into the ventral mesentery, and it will form the ventral pancreas and the main pancreatic duct. Here is a diagram of the formation of the pancreas. As you can see, the dorsal bud of the pancreas arises from the same side that it is on at the end of development. In other words, the dorsal pancreatic bud starts here, and then it ends here. It doesn't move around. However, the ventral pancreatic bud undergoes rotation, as indicated by this arrow. And it will rotate around the duodenum and join the other portion of the pancreas, 
connecting the duct system from the pancreas to the duodenum, as you can see there. And in the adult pancreas, the ventral bud is known as the uncinate process. As with other parts of development, abnormalities can arise when pancreatic development goes wrong. And this brings us to a condition called an annular pancreas. Now, this condition results when there's failure of the ventral bud to rotate or there's abnormal rotation of the ventral bud. Either way, it's just a rotation problem. And this can result in a ring that encircles the second part of the duodenum. And this makes the duodenum more narrow. So there's narrowing, and this narrowing will lead to obstruction, which will cause vomiting. So going back to this image, if the ventral pancreatic bud fails to rotate, then you'll get this ring constricting the duodenum. And this will lead to vomiting. Next is pancreas divisum. This occurs when the ventral and dorsal portions of the duct system fail to fuse. This is a common occurrence and happens around week 8 of development. It is usually asymptomatic, but it can lead to pancreatitis. So going back to this image, the ventral bud does rotate in this condition, and you end up getting both the dorsal and ventral buds together here, but they don't fuse. And this doesn't result in vomiting usually, and this can lead to pancreatitis. Now let's talk about the embryology of the spleen. The spleen is not part of the GI tract, however, it fits well with this lecture because it receives its arterial supply from foregut vessels. And as you can see, it's supplied by the celiac trunk, and this gives rise to the splenic artery. So again, the foregut vasculature, specifically the celiac trunk, also supplies the spleen via the splenic artery. And the spleen develops from mesoderm, whereas the GI tract itself develops from all the germ layers. And the spleen during embryological development is an important site for hematopoiesis, but it becomes a fully formed lymphatic organ by week 23. So now that we've discussed the pathology of the foregut, including the formation of the spleen and the pancreas, now let's discuss hindgut pathology as it relates to embryology. The only disease we'll talk about here is Hirschsprung disease. Hirschsprung disease is a motor disorder of the gut, and the developmental process that results in Hirschsprung disease usually occurs between weeks 4 to 7. So that's pretty early on in development. And this condition is thought to result from the RET gene having a loss of function mutation. And what happens is there's a defect in cranial caudal migration, specifically of the neuroblasts which originate from the neural crest cells. Remember that neural crest cells move caudally. So the rectum is usually the part of the developing GI tract that's impacted when these neuroblasts fail to migrate. Therefore, the lowest part of the GI tract doesn't have ganglia, so we can call that an aganglionic segment. And without those ganglia, the gut tube will fail to relax. And just so we're clear, there's a complete lack of ganglion cells and enteric nerve plexuses. Again, this all has to do with neural crest cell migration. Now let's talk about the clinical presentation. These include symptoms typical of distal colon obstruction, including bilious emesis. And why is the emesis bilious? Well, that's because the bile can enter from the bile duct to the duodenum proximal to the obstruction. These patients can also have abdominal distension, experience a failure to pass meconium or stool within the first 48 hours. And because of this buildup of pressure, then there can be an explosion of gas or stool upon digital exam of the rectum, because you're basically manually relieving that pressure. And treatment for Hirschsprung disease is to perform a resection on the portion of the bowel that's impacted. On this image, you can see the parts of the intestine that are typically associated or impacted by Hirschsprung disease, and that's the distalmost portion. And anything proximal to this is going to get that buildup, which can lead to abdominal distension and vomiting and failure to pass meconium. Now that we've covered foregut and hindgut pathology as it relates to embryology, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. During the development of a fetus, the ventral pancreatic bud rotates as normal, but fails to fuse with the dorsal bud. What is the most likely clinical outcome of this abnormality? Hopefully you notice that what is being described here is pancreas divisum, because we know that there's normal rotation, but there was simply failure of fusion. And recall that pancreas divisum is typically asymptomatic, but it may cause pancreatitis. Now, if you were thinking about vomiting, this would have been consistent with an annular pancreas. And an annular pancreas occurs when there's failure of the ventral bud to rotate around the duodenum, which forms a ring around the duodenum and leads to obstruction, which causes vomiting. But again, this fetus has pancreas divisum. So the most likely clinical outcome is actually no symptoms at all, because they're typically asymptomatic. And that concludes this section.